Aloha, and welcome. I'm Joshua Cooper. Welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around our world on ThinkTech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii, and Wananui Kea. Today's episode I'm hosting is looking at Crimean Tatar's stand for self-determination. Tatar rights diminished during the Russian war. Today, I'm very fortunate to welcome an associate professor of social sciences at the University of Ankara. Philip, thank you so much for joining us to share with us a bit about the struggle for self-determination by the Crimean Tatars over the centuries. Yes, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. We know that Crimean Tatars people maintain their unique history in modern Ukraine, and that Crimean Tatars are Muslim indigenous peoples to the peninsula that have faced severe human rights hardships since this current Russian war, but also historically under various Soviet regimes. Could you share with us a bit about some of the struggles for self-determination that the Crimean Tatar people have dealt with while trying to exercise their fundamental human rights in their homeland? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, the Crimean Tatars uh, are indigenous people of Crimea, as you said, and they go back uh, way into the ancient period. Uh, they derive from uh, Sarmatians, Goths, Kimmerians, Hazars, Kipchaks, all civilizations of the uh, Black Sea area. Uh, but they consolidated their identity in the uh, 16th century uh, under the Crimean Hanate, uh, during which they uh, consolidated into uh, one language, uh, Crimean Tatar language, and one religion. Uh, Muslim religion. Uh, the Crimean Tatars uh, was a significant civilization on a par with Al Andalus uh, in terms of their Islamic achievements. But however, uh, in uh, 1783, Crimea was annexed by the Russian Empire. Uh, and from that on, the calamities of Crimean Tatars started. Uh, more than uh, two-thirds of the Crimean Tatar population had to leave the peninsula to the lands of Ottoman Empire, and only one-third uh, was left uh, in Crimea. Uh, despite the promises of the Russian Empire, the Crimean Tatars suffered in terms of their uh, religious freedoms and in terms of uh, their uh, political and economic freedoms. Uh, they uh, had to join the Soviet Union despite their will. Uh, and uh, in the Soviet Union too, the attempts to detatarize Crimea continued. For example, Stalin deported the remaining Crimean Tatars, the one third, uh, to the Central Asia and Siberia. And after uh, 18 May 1944, not one Tatar was left in the peninsula. Uh, actually, they remembered they forgotten a village, and the Soviet soldiers went back, and they put the, all the villagers in a ship, and they just uh, let the uh, ship sink in the Black Sea. Uh, so that's how the Soviet regime was adamant to detatarize Crimea, uh, to Sovietize and colonize the land completely. Uh, uh, yeah, this was the uh, some of the tragic history of the Crimean Tatars uh, that is unfortunately uh, being repeated today. But I think we'll talk about it soon. No, and it's it's horrible as you share the specifics because many people aren't even aware of the Crimean Tatar people at it being their homeland and making the connection, but showing historically over the centuries what hardships they faced and the brutalization. We know that under Stalin, he accused the approximately 200,000 Crimean Tatars of working with the Germans. But of course, that's what we see happening with today with Putin making claims as well about everyone and denazifying. But your point about the detatarizing is absolutely crucial. And it brings up many of the challenges that they're facing because they're looking at basic human rights, those civil and political rights of freedom of religion, freedom of association, freedom to identify and have one's own nationality, but then also the economic, social, and cultural hardships that they also have faced over the centuries. And as you shared 
really just the humanitarian war aspects of burying them in a ship, sinking it, but also that trek. Maybe you could describe of how hard it was to be moved from their homeland to Siberia and some of the other places and the hardships that they faced during that time. And how did they ever return to be able to reclaim their land and understand and exercise their right of self-determination? Uh, yeah, that's that's an excellent uh, question. The Crimean Tatars were deported actually throughout 18 days. Uh, they were put into cattle wagons and it took 18 days to, for them to reach to Siberia, Urals and various parts of Central Asia. And there they were just dumped there. There were no uh, accommodation, no jobs, no water. And the Crimean Tatars have lost 40% of their population due to the hunger uh, and famine and uh, diseases. After that, uh, the Crimean Tatars uh, lived in a special settlement regime and they had to uh, sign a document every day just to show that they're not moving anywhere else. Uh, and uh, af only after Stalin died in 10 years, the Crimean Tatars were kind of uh, free to leave their special settlement regimes. And what they did was the families for the first time came, to came together because the whole deportation thing, uh, it uh, shuffled the population. So the mothers lost their children, sisters lost their uh, sisters, grandfathers lost their grandchildren, right? So they came together in central, uh, several Central Asian cities such as Tashkent, uh, Chimkent, or uh, Bekabat, Chirchik. And there uh, they formed neighborhoods. And this is how they maintained their identities. They lived close by each other. They spoke their language. And every night at dinner, they taught about their homeland to their children. And uh, it was banned to speak Russian in a crime in Tatar home. So the minute you enter from the uh, home's door, you know, house's uh, door, you have to uh, speak Crimean Tatar. So this was how they were so resilient, so adamant about uh, maintaining their identity and their attachment to homeland, their beloved homeland actually uh, may, uh, you know, uh, help them uh, to uh, strive against all these difficulties. So this is another reason we call the Crimean Tatars indigenous people, because they have this very special ontological relationship to their land. So today they don't re accept that they are any Tatars, right? They want their uh, name to be used fully as Crimean Tatars because their identity emerged in the kind of golden cradle. This is what they call their homeland, in the golden cradle of uh, Crimea. Uh, this is anthropologically so interesting. We don't see many people who have returned their homeland after 50 years of exile. And they did it completely based on their own resources. It's not the Soviet state or Russian state or Ukrainian state that returned them. They organized themselves. They uh, uh, sold their houses in Uzbekistan. Uh, and they uh, put all their belongings in their cars, right? Hundreds and thousands of people moved together uh, back to Crimea. And they uh, formed tent cities, they formed shanty towns, they even, you know, digged holes and lived there until they get settled, right? And they had to uh, fight for this right to return and right to land because uh, the place they returned, you know, as always happens, is not the place you left, right? It's been 50 years past. Uh, so the uh, home population in Crimea, who were Russians that were settled after the 50s, 1950s, right? They were not very welcoming. They thought, uh, you know, uh, these newcomers would threaten them, would take back their property. 
but that's not what Crimean Tatars did because as a, a tradition, they are non-violent people. So they didn't, you know, kick out the people who were actually living their very own houses, right? Using their very own furniture. They said, okay, I understand that you you have been living here for 50 years. So what we will do is we will form new settlements, right? Uh, that's what they did. But uh, even that process has been hampered by a very chauvinistic Russian politicians uh, in independent Sula. Uh, yeah, uh, we can we can talk about it uh, in a minute. Yeah, no, and you really did share a lot about the rich resistance that the Crimean Tatars were persistent and passionate about returning. And this exodus, really, for equality and equity in their homeland is astonishing. And so it's great to share that. And that would almost be enough of a challenge. But now, many people think the current conflict really began on February 24th. But for the Crimean Tatars, it's been since 2014, and we can almost say continuous as you share it throughout history. Can you share what happened in 2014 and some of the most uh, violent as well as violations of human rights that we see happening to the Crimean Tatar people just for being who they are as the indigenous peoples to the peninsula? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, 2000 Before 2014, actually, there was uh, some uh, kind of Russian, as I mentioned, Russian chauvinism, uh, in the uh, peninsular politics, and these people were dominant in the administrative organs uh, of this peninsula, uh, and they were claiming that you know uh, Crimea is Soviet, Crimea is Russian, but these people were not very effective uh, in general among the population. Uh, and the Crimea, you know, Crimea was part of Ukraine, and uh, it was in a relatively uh, democratic atmosphere because Ukraine was not like Russia. It did not have a very uh, authoritarian structure. It, it had it, it. It was not perfect democracy, but it had this kind of de facto pluralism, right? because there wasn't one person like Putin who could monopolize power. In Ukraine, there was this kind of balance of different oligarchs, different political uh, people, political personalities. Uh, so there was this plurality, there was relative uh, atmosphere of freedom. And Crimean Tatars, being the resourceful people they are, they took advantage of all these opportunities they began to rebuild their national identity, their national culture. They opened uh, national schools. They started to teach their language to kids to the kindergarten level. Uh, they wrote new course books. They opened museums, theaters, dance troops. Uh, they uh, re recovered their you know, former uh, Hanate history or archival documents. Everything was going well in terms of uh, rejuvenating their lost culture. Uh, but 2014, and it was, there was a relative, you know, peace in the peninsula as well. Uh, the, the, the Russians got used to Crimean Tatars. Crimean Tatars got used to the Slavic peninsula or, uh, Slavic people of the peninsula. Uh, but the, so there was no kind of a, a Russian uh, separatism or, you know, uh, Russian demand for Crimea to be a Russian peninsula or anything. Uh, the Russian people also were satisfied with living in Ukraine. But suddenly in 2014, just after the Euromaidan revolution happened in Kiev, uh, Russia interfered uh, in Crimea with force, with 40,000 troops on ground, uh, they uh, 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 obtained all kind of strategic points, such as you know uh, important uh, military bases uh, and uh, important government buildings, and they actually uh, instituted a kind of coup d'état. Uh, and this was also sudden. Ukraine did not have a government at the moment. 
so they could not defend Crimea. And the Crimean Tatars became the only Ukrainians in the peninsula. They sided with Ukraine despite a lot of pressure from both Russian Federation, Putin, and also from some of the Russian politicians in the peninsula. They waved the Ukrainian flag on the streets. They took to the streets uh, without violence, and they tried to resist the occupation. Unfortunately, uh, the, the new rulers of the Crimea organized a fake referendum, uh, which wasn't uh, appropriate in terms of in line with any kind of international law. Uh, and they declared one-sidedly that, you know, they annexed, annexed the uh, peninsula, despite the, uh, the Crimean Tatars boycotted this referendum. And after the wars, uh, the Crimean Tatars, in a way, were punished uh, in different ways. Uh, for example, uh, uh, they were forced to leave the peninsula. Some of the Crimean Tatars, especially um, indigenous leaders, majorless leaders, uh, the the re representatives uh, in the Crimean Tatar Parliament, right, national indigenous parliament, they were prohibited entering the peninsula, and some of them, uh, if they resisted, you know, they were put into prison. And uh, some of them, uh, like 150 Crimean Tatars, are uh, right now in the Russian prisons uh, because of all these kind of political uh, crimes uh, that was made by the uh, you know Russian government. Uh, all the Crimean Tatar cultural institutions were shot, such as national schools, uh, such as uh, newspapers, media outlets. Uh, and uh, Crimean Tatars are constantly right now under supervision. The other day I was talking to a professor who just came from Crimea to Turkey, and he was telling me even teaching uh, in the university became a problem. You know, you don't know what to say because anything you say uh, is punishable according to Russian law. So there is a complete lack of freedom of speech, freedom of thought, right now uh, and Crimean Tatars are under a lot of political pressure. No, it really is so informative for you to share because people can't fathom, but it's an indigenous struggle for self-determination that has its own unique culture, own language, own history, and of course then seen as a threat to this invading force. And even Human Rights Watch reinforced many of the points you shared because they pointed out in March 27th and 28th in 2019, 23 Crimean Tatars were arrested. And of course, they were labeled as terrorists. And this, of course, is just a tool that had been happening to indigenous peoples around the world to silence them. But as you point out, the Crimean Tatars are still struggling. And as you shared earlier, when there was that peaceful period, the Crimean Tatars still went to the UN Working Group on Indigenous Peoples, to the UN Permit Forum on Indigenous Issues and shared and demanded small gains and to continue to be able to exercise their culture. But what you're sharing since 2014 is really a continuation of the genocide that happened before then. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, Crimean Tatars, yes, uh, since they returned to the peninsula, uh, they asked uh, for rights of self-determination because uh, the Crimean Tatars are only uh, legitimate owners of Crimea because they have been there uh, the longest. They are First Nations of Crimea, uh, and uh, they respect the rights of all the other communities there. What they want is they want to uh, protect the environment of Crimea, which is under uh, a lot of danger from Russia right now because Russia is basically turning the peninsula into a military base. Uh, there are a lot of uh, weapons uh, and a lot of uh, nuclear uh, weapons also are placed in the peninsula as we watch from the uh, news uh, every day. And the Crimean uh, Crimea has been uh, going under a drought uh, because of the 
uh, lack of water because it's uh, it was getting its water from Ukraine and now it's all these channels are shut and uh, Russia has built this bridge and this highway without disregarding the environment or the you know uh, culture of the people there without consulting them uh, in any ways. And Russia also does not recognize the Crimean Tatars as indigenous people of the Crimea. Uh, and they, as far as their concerns, uh, according to their Russian historiography, uh, they recognize Crimea as a Russian land and uh, Crimean Tatars as, uh, you know, uh, produce, uh, suc successors of the Mon Mongolian Empire. But this is this is not true. This is like a one-sided uh, reading of history uh, without attending to the historical facts. Uh, yeah, this uh, because of all this, the Crimean Tatars have been active in the UN uh, mechanisms uh, to defend uh, their rights to self-determination in the international platforms because it wasn't recognized by Russia. And uh, it was only recognized by Ukraine after 2014. And the process is also still going very slow with regards to uh, how, what does the Crimean Tatar self-determination mean in Ukraine? What does it entail? What kind of rights, what kind of national cultural autonomy would Crimean Tatars be given after Crimea is uh, liberated? from Russia. Uh, so these are the uh, main issues for Crimean Tatars right now because it's about their survival. If the Crimean Tatars does not have this right to sovereignty uh, in Crimea, then their uh, culture is in, the, uh, in danger. Their language is already an endangered language. Uh, so right now, despite the war, it is very important for international bodies and Ukraine to attend uh, the rights of self-determination of the Crimean Tatars, uh, because otherwise uh, their survival will be in, in danger. Thank you so much for the representation of that rainbow of rights that are all being violated, but it is part of a larger wave of oppression against Crimean Tatars that Russia has been doing. We know there's different movements such as Crimean Solidarity that was established in 2016 and other movements. Can you share What's happening today since February 24th with that intensification of the war? And as you shared, more of a militarization of their homeland and what how the Crimean Tatars are really struggling and standing up for their right of self-determination with the current war. But also, as you shared, that potential for a plural democracy after the liberation where the Crimean Tatars could have a, a much stronger role in Ukrainian society, but also have greater autonomy and exercise their self-determination? Uh, yeah, after uh, 2014, as I said, there are daily human rights violations. Uh, and the, today, uh, the prison terms of Crimean Tatars, uh, the last number I have is 1,221 years in total. The Crimean Tatars has got prison terms. So one of the important activists, Neriman Jalal, for example, he is the vice president of Crimean Tatar Parliament. He recently got uh, 17 years in prison. And just because he's a member of this majlis, this Crimean Tatar organization, not that he committed anything violent. Uh, 2,000 majlis members, you know, local uh, parliament members are pressured every day with their families. Uh, there are more than 1 million illegal court cases against the Crimean Tatars. Um, and uh, there is currently a forced conscription. So the Crimean Tatars are uh, disproportionately conscripted to the Russian army uh, to fight against their own citizens because, you know, uh, there can be Crimean Tatars working, for, uh, so fighting for Ukraine on the, in the Ukrainian army, and you have Crimean Tatars here forced to fight for Russia. Uh, so this is most tragic for any nation because they will have to uh, kill each other, right? Uh, 
Uh, other than that, uh, the Crimean Tatars, uh, not only in Crimea, but who are living in southern Ukraine, which are also under occupation, you know, part of Kherson, uh, part of Zaporozhye, right? Uh, we know at least a uh, hundred of them are kidnapped. We don't know where they're taken, but we know that Russia has this policy of uh, taking them to inside Russia for uh, the camps, which Russia calls filtration camps, right? This is similar to the camps used by China against the Uyghur Turks, right? Uh, there they are kind of re-educated and, uh, you know, they were uh, interrogated uh, to learn, you know, how loyal they are Ukraine and different FSB tactics are used against them uh, to change their views, change their opinions, right? Uh, these are also some of the uh, uh, other uh, pressures uh, against the Crimean Tatars, other challenges uh, that come from the current uh, invasion. And it, it's horrible to realize how holistic these campaigns of repression are. And as you said, how people are, really it's a culture of fear to try to make sure that they don't exercise their basic human rights. And for doing just that, of course, then they could face even more hardships. And then the sad part is you're talking about the humanitarian law violations of Russia to force conscription, but then also those rehabilitation camps that have gained greater attention in the media also show that we must stand together to demand an end to these horrible practices by the Russian regime. Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, I think uh, this, I see them as part of uh, uh, the another policy of detatarization of Crimea because Russia is in a, in a way trying to force Crimean Tatars uh, to leave uh, Crimea by themselves, right? increasing the pressure to such level, uh, you know, even threatening the conscript them, right? Uh, the Crimean Tatars actually have been leaving Crimea uh, more than they did in 2014. Uh, so especially uh, young men, right, who are at the conscription age, uh, they had to, uh, they tried to escape just like many Russians we know, they escape Russia because they don't want to fight in a war that they don't believe in. Uh, so uh, this hybrid deportation, we call this a hybrid deportation. Uh, Russia, okay, is not uh, deporting them by putting them into cattle wagons, but preparing all the circumstance, circumstances for them uh, to leave their own. But this is so tragic because uh, if we consider, you know, how much they try to, uh, return Crimea, right? Uh, the Crimean Tatar leader, Mustafa Jemilev, for example, uh, he has uh, he has suffered in Soviet prisons for 15 years, and he had the longest uh, hunger strike in the world, 303 days, and he fell into like 30 kilograms uh, during this hunger strike. Uh, uh, and he, he lost his hearing ability right now, for example, because of that. Uh, this uh, leader of Crimean Tatars, who is about, you know, 78 years old right now, Russia, uh, after he, you know, uh, str uh, struggled so much to return uh, to homeland, and that's why, you know, he undertook this hunger strike, uh, right now Russia prohibited Mustafa Jemilev uh, to enter. Uh, his own homeland, right? And he is uh, in exile uh, in Ukraine right now and trying to, again, you know, trying to again to, to return uh, to their homeland. Uh, it's, it's so unjust uh, uh, for the Crimean Tatars to be deprived of their indigenous land. Thank you so much for sharing really that line of liberation, the Crimean Tatars' rich history of always seeking their homeland, to be able to exercise their right of self-determination, to speak their language, to have their culture, and to live where their ancestors have, which has been very informative and will keep 
this important angle of the current Ukraine war in the minds of humanity to make sure that they never forget the Crimean Tatars as we go forward. Uh, thank you for bringing this issue uh, into attention. And I would like to say hello to all your viewers. Mahalo. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.